living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The first Sunday after the Epiphany is always the baptism of Christ. So Epiphany was yesterday, January 6th, 12 days after Christmas. And as you remember, Epiphany marks the journey of the wise men or the mad guy, the more appropriate term probably, arriving to Jesus. And in the Gospel of Matthew, in which the Magi appear, they, uh, they arrive at Jesus' house sometime after he's born. We don't know when, <laughs> um, but about a couple years even. So then we sort of jump ahead 30 years to the lesson we have this morning, which is the very beginning of the Gospel of Mark. And we have Jesus and John in the Gospel of Mark meeting for the first time. So the, the interesting part about thinking about the, the baptism of Christ is that it shows up in every Gospel, but each of the Gospel writers presents it a little differently. So in the Gospel of Mark, we don't have any of the back story. We don't have any of the nativity story. We don't have any indication that John and Jesus are even related. So, it doesn't change that that, could, that that was the story of Luke, but in the Gospel of Mark, that's why you're not seeing that here. So, John is baptizing. He's, that's his, his role. He's in the wilderness, as we talked about in Advent, because he came up twice in Advent, and he, he's show, he's, people show up to him. Remember, they leave the city, and they come to the River Jordan to be baptized in the River Jordan. I read a really interesting uh, commentary this week from a woman who went to the Holy Land, and her goal was to get water from the Jordan River, and to bring it back, and to put it in the baptismal font of her church. And by the time she got it home, and had a baptism in which she would have put this Jordan River water in with the water in the baptismal font, the water was gross and slimy and silty and smelly, and she couldn't even drink it. So, <laughs> the Jordan River, in current day, is not a very clean river. <laughs> um, we have more time. Sometime we can talk about sort of the, the politics, like actual politics, that happen because of where the Jordan River is and who's in charge of the water and all of that. But in Jesus' day, that's where he goes. And interestingly, he travels from Nazareth, which is in the north, about 70 miles from Jerusalem. We don't know where exactly John is in the, um, in the wilderness along the Jordan. But he travels to go be baptized by John. So he's one with the people in this story, which I really like. It wasn't something I thought about before this week, but he goes to be baptized just like everybody else. He may or may not need it, but he decides he's going to go. And he shows up and he's baptized. And as he's coming up out of the water, he hears the voice of God tell him, You are my beloved. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. And he's been to any baptism we've done here, any baptism in the Episcopal Church ever. You know that those are the words you say to kids when they're angry. <laughs> they're the words we say when we baptize. You are my child, the beloved of God. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit, marked as Christ's own forever. And with you, I am well pleased. It's a really powerful message. And I think it's a message that a lot of people hear today. So we have this voice of God that shows up in these lessons over and over. The voice of God as the creator in Genesis, creating light from darkness, creating some order from chaos, from the void. And then in that lesson, in Genesis, it was good because God created it. God created it and it was good. So we are created with goodness from the very beginning. 
And if you read the psalm, you've got this voice of God that shows up over and over again. And in the psalm, if you look closely, the voice of God isn't, you know, that still small voice <laughs> that the prophet hears on the mountain. It's this loud, sort of almost like destructive power, breaking the cedars of Lebanon, splitting the flame, the flame from the fire. So it's taking this creation that God created and sort of shaking it up and making us know it. That, that God is in that. God is part of that. So it is good. The voice of God is a creative power. The voice of God is a, is a power. But we know bad things still happen. As we in congregation that knows that very acutely this week. The bad things still happen. But if you look at that lesson in Genesis and you think about what we read on Christmas Eve, there is light in the darkness. God creates light in the darkness, and it was good. The light has already won. We are called to share the light. And as Jesus is coming up out of the water, that spirit descends on him, and he's called the beloved child, reminded again that he is good, that he has some. Some authority to go do good in the world, go do something good. So we are promised on this baptism of Christ Sunday that that is us too, that we too are the beloved, that we too are children of God. And we need to not forget that. Despite all of the things that the world has been telling us, it's a pretty counterintuitive message if you think about it. And that it's unconditional. How much in our lives is unconditional? Most things in the world in which we live, in the world in which we you know, have our being, get to do something to earn it. Or if you don't do something, you don't earn it anymore. Right? There's conditions to almost everything, if you think about it. But God's love and your belovedness and your goodness are completely unconditional. Henry Nowen is one of my favorite spiritual writers. And he says, he describes it this way about, the, about being the beloved and being called the beloved. He says, these words reveal the true identity of Jesus as the beloved. Jesus truly heard that voice. And all of his thoughts, words, and actions came forth from his deep knowledge that he was infinitely loved. Jesus lived his life from that inner place of love. I know that the words spoken to Jesus when he was baptized are words spoken also to me and to all who are brothers and sisters of Jesus. My tendencies toward self-rejection and self-deprecation make it hard to hear these words truly and let them descend into the center of my heart. But once I have received these words fully, I am set free from my compulsion to prove myself to the world and can live in it without belonging to it. Once I have accepted the truth that I am God's beloved child, unconditionally loved, I can be sent into the world to speak and to act as Jesus did. So we have that power, we have that authority. We are beloved children of God, and we are called to share that love with everybody we meet, to remind everybody we meet that they too are the beloved child of God. On this first Sunday of the week after the Epiphany, remember your baptism. I'm sure you may not actually. Jerry remembers his conditional baptism we did this summer. You may not actually remember your baptism. But remember who you are and who you are called to be. And that at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that you remember that you are unconditionally 